Good morning. Welcome to our service today as we celebrate the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Today as we study God's Word together, we focus on the fact that in this world we look for security in so many different areas, and yet the only true thing that gives us security is our Lord Jesus and what he has done for us. And for that, we thank and praise him today as we join together our hearts in song. We begin our service today with the singing of the first hymn, Father, we praise you. We worship our triune God. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen.
with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Mercifully grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. For without your help, we are unable to please you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. I now invite the children of the CLA choir to come forward for their song. Please note that the choir will sing the refrain the first time and you are invited to sing the refrain thereafter.
Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, beginning with the first verse. In this lesson, we are reminded that in all of life's situations and in everything that comes our way, we have one thing that offers us the most security. And here the author quotes one of the Psalms to tell us what that is. The Lord is our helper. Think of the Lord as your helper, not as he's the one who gets stuck doing all the work, like when you ask someone to help you move furniture for you. But this is the one who helps you, who is there to be a joy and a blessing to you. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all in the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the, all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our next hymn, All Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, beginning with the 19th verse. I kind of wonder today if you would tell this parable to a person on the street. Which person they would rather be? The parable is about a rich man, had it all, and then about a beggar who had a rough life, sores all over his body, was just in misery. Which one would they rather be? The one who puts his confidence in his wealth or the one who puts his confidence in the Lord? We'll see in the end that there's only one that pays off. Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, please rise for the reading of our gospel. 
There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even dogs, the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated. I now invite the younger children of the congregation forward to the front for the children's lesson. Good morning. Do you guys have anything that you have that makes you feel really safe? So, for example, when you go to sleep at night, do you have something that you have that you keep close to you to make you feel safe? What do you have? I have the teddy hot hearts on it. You have what? I have teddy hot hearts on it. You have a teddy with hearts on it? Teddy? Yeah, we keep that close to us. What about you, Zoe? fat hippo named Hippie, and who would not feel safe with having a fat hippo in bed with them, right? Or if you think about when you go to the store and you see all sorts of strangers around, what's one thing you might do to feel safe? Do you have someone that makes you feel safe? Who? Your parents, maybe you grab onto their hands and say, I, I need to grab on here and they make me feel safe, and maybe if someone looks a little bit sketchy, you kind of duck behind their leg because mom or dad's going to protect you. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment you go up and you, you uh, are staying in a cabin, and you're outside playing outside that cabin, and all of a sudden you see this big grizzly bear. You think you'll grab your hippo? Think that's going to keep you safe? How about your teddy bear with hearts? Do you think that's going to keep you safe and say, hey, I know your friend here. I got a bear too. You're going to grab mom and dad's hand and say, mom, you go talk to the bear. Do you think you might run inside the cabin? But imagine you get inside that cabin, you go, oh, good, we're safe. And then you look and you see the doors hanging wide open. That's not going to keep you safe, is it, if the door's hanging wide open? You see, sometimes we put our faith and our hope in the things that we can see because those things give us comfort. And it is comforting to grab mom and dad's hand. And it is comforting to sleep with a hippo or a, or a teddy bear at night. But there's so much that comes at in this world that we can see that scares us and not a hand or a hippo or a teddy bear is going to help. We heard just before in our lesson where does our help come from? Did you hear what God said? The Lord is our helper. He's the one that keeps us safe. 
We just heard in that lesson before, Lazarus, he didn't have anything in this life. He had sores on his body. He was poor. He just begged and hoped he could eat the crumbs that fell from the other man's table. And yet, did you notice how he was the richest man in the story? What did he have that the other guy didn't? He had faith. He had his Savior in his heart. He had his Savior who said, I've come here to be your Savior and take away all your sins. And even when this world is kind of scary, even if there are bears, what do we have? We have that exact same faith and that exact same promise that when we leave this world, we will be with the Lord forever. And so today we celebrate that because you and I, even if we don't have a penny to our name, we are the richest people on earth because we have Jesus. Let's fold our hands and have a prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for calling us to faith, to believe in you. Continue to live in our hearts and give us the promise that no matter what comes our way, no matter what scary things come into our lives, you are always with us and you will keep your promise to take us to be with you in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. You guys can go sit back down and we will continue with our next hymn, Lord, Thee I Love With All My Heart.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Amos, chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. You notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kelma, Kelna and look at it. Go from there to Great Hamath and then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the, disaster, the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and your lo and lounging will end. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it that offers you security? This past week, I had to travel and went through the airport and went through the glorious joy of passing through the TSA checkpoint. Does that offer you security? Those body scans and the metal detectors and the padding down, does that offer you security while flying? Maybe. When you shut up your home at night, you have your locks on your doors and your security system and maybe your Second Amendment right. Does that offer you security? You have your phones, your computers. You have your antivirus software and your firewalls and your passwords. Does that offer you security? Well, you know how it happens, though. Those elements of security that we have sometimes break down. Recently, I had a friend tell me that he had been traveling through the airport for about five, six times, and he had a Leatherman multi-tool that has a few sharp knives embedded in it. Five times or so, he goes through security, and nobody says a thing as it's in his carry-on. And finally, the sixth time, they take it away from him. Now, my friend is not a security threat, but could you imagine if someone who was intent on evil had that possibility? Or what about your home? You have your security system and your locks and your Second Amendment, and what happens when you forget to lock the doors? What happens when you are just too lazy to go set the alarm? Do we still have people bypassing security systems? Yeah, absolutely. Who here can honestly admit that they've never had their phone hacked or a virus, or their computer, that you've never had any kind of issues with that. Even though you have all this protection and security, you feel a little insecure at times. Well, this morning, and as we study God's word, we are going to talk about this element of security. But it's not something that we bring to the table. It's not something you can purchase online. It's not something that you can put in place and make everybody go through it in order to feel secure. It's rather something given to us by the Holy Spirit. And so as we study God's word from the Old Testament, we have this encouragement from the Holy Spirit because we have something that's better than anything that we have in this world. More secure than the TSA, even better than ADT responding to your home emergency, even better than Norton's antivirus software. We have the Lord. And today the Holy Spirit encourages us to live the secure life. Now our lesson today takes us to a time where you had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, and both of them were highly prosperous. Things were going well for them. We will see that they were doing well politically and economically and militarily, and yet listen to what Amos says to them at the beginning of our lesson. He says, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. 
Go to Kelna and look at it, and from there go to Great Hamath, and then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You see, what had happened here is Israel and Judah, even though they had been once a united kingdom, were separated, but yet they were both strong militarily. In fact, you have some naysayers here. The prophet Amos comes to them and says, look, you guys are complacent, you're living securely, but that's not a good thing. And they say, but hold up a sec. Have you not seen our victories? Kelna and Hamath in the north, we've expanded our territory. And in the south, we've gone into Gath, which is, think of the Gaza Strip nowadays. Both kingdoms were as big as they could be. How can you say that we aren't secure? Relying on their savviness politically, diplomacy, their military. They say life's good. There's not a problem here. In fact, he says, look at how well they were doing economically. Here you talk about people having a few extra bucks to spend. Listen to how they were spending them. You lie down on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlfuls and use the finest lotions. You talk about having all sorts of expendable income. Beds adorned with ivory. You'd get arrested nowadays for having that, but here you have these finest things that they were having. The best foods, wines, not by the cup full, not by the glass full, but by the bowl full. Spa treatments of the finest order. These people were living large. They were prosperous militarily. They were prosperous economically. And they were thinking to themselves, life is good when life is rolling like this. There's an empty space. And these people had an empty space in their hearts. And notice you'll see the prophet give you a little idea of what that was. You put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. You think about all the things that they had filled their lives with and how secure they felt and how complacent they were. They were not worrying about anything but themselves. And you think about their politics politically. Where had the kings gotten to where they were? It was by treachery. You look at the northern kingdom and you can't find a single good godly king. You find, as you read the history, assassination after assassination, coup after coup. And in the South, they weren't much better. What do you notice that's missing from each one of these? Strong militarily, strong economically, strong politically, and yet, it's the Lord. It was completely absent from their lives. Remember how he had called them to be his chosen people. He had told them he would be their God and they should follow him. And when they had these successes, God got pushed to the edges. And when they found more success, God completely got removed from the picture. Why need him if everything is going well? Why have him in your life when everything is secure as they felt? And so they pushed God out of the picture even though he had been like a husband to them. He had called them. He wanted them to be his bride, and they were a cheating spouse, going after all sorts of other gods, manufacturing their own gods with the golden calves that they constructed, chasing after wealth, chasing after power, chasing after fortune. And the Lord wasn't in the picture. You know, when you think about it today, are we familiar with that same sort of thinking as 21st century Christians? Is there that tendency or that temptation to feel secure and complacent? Because these people said, we're God's people. He called Abraham and we're the descendants of Abraham and so life is good. 
He's never going to turn his back on us. Even though they continually walked away from him. Even though they continually cut out time for him. Do we know what that's like? Do we feel secure? We say, well, I'm a member of a church. I go to worship. Celebrate the Lord's Supper. I got my kids in a Christian school. Life is good. And then do we check out the rest of the time, the rest of the week? Not putting our faith and trust and living our faith for him. Do we look at our relationship with him and say, you know what? We have these checks that we have to make in our lives. These boxes to check. Go to church, check. Go to worship and Bible study, check. Go to prayer and devotion, check. God, aren't you satisfied with me? Aren't you pleased with what a good Christian I am? As though we were somehow buying his love by what we do. Or what about when it comes to complacency? We know what it is to be complacent, don't we? That's the problem with the people of Israel. They were complacent. They weren't concerned about the spiritual well-being of one another. In fact, listen to what he says. You do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph, one of the tribes of Israel. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and your lounging will end. Just one generation after our lesson, that northern kingdom that was so politically prosperous and militarily mighty would be carried off and destroyed and never heard from again. From the nation of Judah, they were just 150 years from going into exile and going into captivity. Everything was going to be lost. And why was that? They were complacent. They didn't care about the spiritual well-being of their brothers. They didn't care about the spiritual well-being of themselves. And so they didn't concern themselves. They were concerned with the here and now, kind of like the man in our gospel for today. He was wealthy, so life was good. But you know, that complacency, that self-security can impact our hearts as well. Today is kind of an exception because we have such a full house with with the school singing. But think, think about our expectations. Do we as a church go, you know what, if we're in the mid-60s for attendance, that's pretty good. But do we come complac become complacent when we say, you know, I haven't seen so-and-so in a few weeks or a few months. Maybe it's even gone into a year. Eh, we got 60 in worship, that's okay. Do we become complacent when we say, you know, I, I know I'm in church and my kids are in church, but my neighbor, eh, he knows where we're at. Mom and dad, I, I've told them once, I've told them twice, I've told them a dozen times. If they haven't listened by the twelfth time, eh, do we become complacent? You see, God knows our hearts and he knows that oftentimes we act like the people of Israel did. We find security in the fact that we say, well, I'm doing this for God or I'm doing that for God and so he should be happy. But do we live up to his standards that he expects? Remember what he said, be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy and that's not us. He tells us to pray continually, but often we don't. Produce fruits in keeping with repentance. Sometimes I don't feel very repentful. And yet, God has called us to disregard our sin, to seek him, and to find him. To not become complacent, to not become secure in our own spiritual lives that we ourselves are producing, but to seek him. Because otherwise, we end up the same place the people of Israel did. We end up drifting away from him. We end up digging our own problems and our own graves, really, spiritually. And so listen to what he has to say to us. Don't be immune to the complacency. Don't be like that person sitting on the railroad track and not minding the train that's coming your way. Because that's really what it is when we ignore our sin, when we ignore the fact that God has called us to be something better than what we are. 
when we ignore the fact that we have sins to repent of and need to flee to him for security and safety. You see, God doesn't want us to be complacent in our lives, but rather to seek him, lest we end up separated from him for eternity. Because notice what happens. Our complacency starts to erode that in relationship with him. And when we start eroding that relationship with him, before you know it, it can be washed away. If there's no faith, then there's no hope. If there's no hope, then what are we doing here? But you see, the Lord knows the hope that we need. He knows the solution that we need, and he gives it to us in Jesus. It's kind of interesting if you look at the book of Amos. Nine chapters long. You want to know how many verses are in there that share the good news of the gospel? Out of nine chapters, the last five verses. Why is that? It's not that the Lord hated them and wanted them to just hear all bad news. So serious was their situation. So separated were they from him. They needed to have their system shocked so that he could sort of slap them in the face and say, wake up from your complacent situation and see how serious it is. And once you do, the Lord has good news. Jesus has taken away your sin. That's the same message he gives to us today. When I become complacent, when I become self-secure in what I do, checking off all those boxes to say I'm a good little Christian, Jesus said, no, I've done everything because I, God demands holiness, I gave it for you. God demands sacrifice for sin, I gave that for you also. God demands that if you're going to live with me, you need life. Well, I gave that for you as well as I rose from the dead. And so as much as we can erode our relationship with him, the Lord has something so much better for us because he wants us to make that U-turn. He wants us to come to him in repentance. He wants us to have that relationship with him. And through his word, he supplies it. He gives us that relationship. He gives us that faith. He calls us to that standing. For many of us, it began right there. The font of baptism where God said, here is my word and here is some water. And you put those together for life. Earlier, we confessed our sins with one another. And there you heard the absolution. God himself speaking and saying, I have forgiven you. We celebrate the Lord's Supper where God says, here is my son's body and blood given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. All of this is to strengthen that relationship with him and to keep that standing that he has given us as free and forgiven in him. You know, as we go through this world, there's so many things that seem to offer us security, but in the end, there is such a letdown. But you have something that's so much better. You have a God who comes to you in his humble word, who speaks forgiveness to you, who gives you the assurance that nothing can separate you from his love, who promises to be your helper in time of need, who promises to be with you when things are going well, and who tells you, as much as the world seems to crumble upon us, as much bad as we see in the world, and as scary as it may be, you can live the secure life in your Savior's protecting arms. Amen. Please stand. Now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Having heard the word of God, we now join in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the explanation of Mark the Martin Luther's explanation of the second article of the Apostles' Creed. We join together. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. 
He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. If you have an offering today, we, will, we do have an offering plate available in the back of the chapel as you exit. Also, you have instructions in the bulletin if you'd like to make use of our online giving platform of Tidely or bill pay with your bank. We join in prayer. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love towards all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up children to serve in ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. And we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We continue with our CLA choir anthem, God is so good.
Let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close our service with the singing of the last hymn, My Worth is Not in What I Own. Good morning once again to all of you. Special welcome to those who are our guests today. Uh, we invite all of you to join us for refreshments after the service. They will be in the cafeteria, so go out the door you came in. The cafeteria is on your right-hand side. Also, a special welcome and thank you to the students of Concord Lutheran Academy under the direction of Mrs. Rosenbaum and Mrs. Treader on the piano. Uh, we thank you for beautifying our service today. Yes, you. Also, uh, 
after we will have our Wells Connection video, but we also hear Mrs. Treader give us a little update on CLA. Uh, so our Wells Connection video, we see what's going on around our synod here. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. The goal of Wells Home Missions is simple. Preach the gospel of Christ. And the truth is that the more churches that Wells Home Missions plants, the more that good news can be preached. Preached to the people who need to hear about the forgiveness found in Jesus. People like Lauren. baby's baptism but I think what's interesting about doing it as an adult it feels like it, it feels like a gift it feels like a gift Lauren Glennie would be the first one to tell you she lived a life far away from God like a rising percentage of Americans Lauren wasn't brought to church growing up after her parents divorce when she was a teenager she was filled with worry fear and anxiety she just wanted to escape it all. Alcohol was her go-to comfort, and it quickly got out of her control. You know, you have pain, and you try to make sense of the pain, and find a way to get some relief. And I was looking for relief in every other place, um, but God. Despite wanting to become sober, Lauren's alcohol abuse continued for many years until a very close friend, Adam, suddenly died in a car accident. And it was devastating. It was really, really hard. And I think I saw how that affected everybody that was still here, like his family, his friends. And I didn't want to do that to my family. And it kind of made me wake up. In that moment, Lauren put an end to alcohol. And then shortly after, she joined Adam's family at church one Sunday morning to support them. But that church just so happened to be in town Lutheran Church, a Wells home mission in Atlanta, Georgia. Mission churches are, by nature of, of what they are, they're set up to reach people who are far from God and people who have questions. Lauren brought her questions, and the church was ready to help her find answers. Through Bible information class and conversations with Christians at In Town, Lauren came to find the peace, comfort, and forgiveness that only Jesus provides. Learning God's love and grace for you and compassion and forgiveness, it's freeing. It's freeing, and it opens your, it opens your eyes. Uh, to a whole different way of living, to, to live life and look at life from a completely different perspective. Lauren is just one example of the countless souls that are being connected to Jesus through Wells Home Mission Churches. However, there are so many more out there yet to be reached. That's why, starting in 2023, Wells is embarking on an ambitious initiative to plant 100 new missions in 10 years. The lost are not out there raising their hands, screaming for us to come out to them. They don't know they're lost. We know the gospel. We know what Jesus has done for us. We know uh, we have a message that's always relevant because no matter uh, what's going on in the world, the gospel is always there to give us peace, to give us joy, to give us comfort to give us hope. The reality of the harvest being plentiful, but the workers being few, is certainly a struggle in many of our Wells congregations at the moment. However, Pastor Mark Gabb says there's really no other option besides to go. Go and make disciples. If we try to hold back and say, we gotta hunker down and we gotta um, try to fill the vacancies before we go out and we create more um, missions or more vacancies, uh, I'm not really sure that's even following what Jesus told us to do with the Great Commission. 
He said to go, and that includes nurturing, but that also includes outreach. We would rather fail trying to do this than fail to try it. If we fail to try it, we won't accomplish it. But if we have a God who can do immeasurably more than ever that we can ask or imagine, if we have a God who can do that, then why not try it, see how he blesses it, and give God praise for how he blesses it. God willing, this initiative will have an eternal impact on people all over North America. People that we may not know yet, but people for whom Jesus Christ died for. People that our Heavenly Father wants to welcome into his family with open, loving arms. We have a message that needs to get out there. When I talk to people and see people that are hurting and they don't know this peace of God that transcends all understanding, and I know by God's grace we have it, that just excites me for the future. My faith allows me to wake up every day and just focus on the 24 hours ahead of me. And because I'm not in control, because I know I'm not in control, I don't have to worry about tomorrow or five years down the line. And I don't have to worry about the past because God forgave me for it. It's life-changing, clearly. It really, really is. Within the last 10 years, Wells Home Missions has been planting, on average, about six or seven home mission congregations per year across the continent. That means that although the goal of 10 mission congregations every year for 10 years is bold, it's certainly not outrageous, especially considering our God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. You can hear more of Lauren's story and learn how you can get involved in this initiative by visiting our website. invite Mrs. Trenner to give us an update and also uh, just one note our family Bible study will continue next Sunday so we'll have fellowship after this but next Sunday we'll pick up with family Bible study. Oh yeah, assist parents in educating, equipping, and encouraging children for this life and for eternity. And I thank Mrs. Rosenbaum for picking out some music that I think highlighted our theme so well for the year. Uh, our first song, our, our first, our second song highlights God is so good, and how good is He that He made us His workmanship, His handiwork. And then when we look at our theme verse in Ephesians, it continues with that we have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And that was our first song, Each One Has a Gift, highlights some of the ways, some of those good works that God has prepared for us to do. And so we continue to serve your children and our congregations with the gifts that we've been given as faculty and staff, but also the ability for us to be able to come up in front and have the children begin to learn how to use their gifts to beautify worship. We thank you for that opportunity, and it's a wonderful blessing that we're able to continue to do this, and it really fits in with our theme. A um, couple of highlights from the school year so far. We started the year completely full. Our enrollment is full, so we do have a waiting list at our school right now, which is wonderful news. Uh, I'll talk about that come back to that in a minute with one of our um, announcements about what we're doing for, for the future. But a couple of things we're involved in right now. Um, we've started our 
5K fundraiser for tuition assistance. And uh, Mrs. Christina Schrader is kind of heading that up. Um, basically, it's a 5K that you can run. It's virtual. Uh, you can sign up for the 5K, and that what the money, the registration fee goes toward tuition assistance. Um, you could sponsor a student to run if you're not the running kind, but you want to have one of the students run. You can uh, also do that, and that registration money again will go towards tuition assistance. Or if you'd like to just make a donation to CLA for our tuition assistance fund, uh, then you could do that as well. Please talk to Pastor Schrader or Mrs. Christina Schrader for information on how to do any of those three things. Our tuition assistance fund is something that we use to help families who see the cost of tuition at a Christian school and say that's, that's an awful lot of money. I think maybe we can't do that. And so then we can offer them some help with the tuition that doesn't come out of our budget. It's a separate thing. And uh, the tuition assistance fund then helps us, our families, to do that. We also have a couple of activities that have started. Um, the upper grades, grades five through eight, have begun playing volleyball. And we've played a couple of Thursdays now and are having a lot of fun with it. Uh, it's a co-ed team, so everybody in grades five to eight gets to play. And we drive down to Reformation Lutheran School down in San Diego uh, and play down there uh, against some of the other Wells uh, schools in the area. But we also just had a game this past Thursday here at the high school with, against uh, Grace Christian Schools as well. And then finally, we'll wrap up our volleyball season in October at a big tournament that we'll have here at the high school, October 22nd. So if you want to come watch some grade school volleyball and have some fellowship, you're welcome to come and join us for that. Uh, the last announcement I have is that the SCLISA board uh, that's our governing board of our school, is continuing to work on the steps needed to place a modular classroom building on Christ the Vine's campus for Concord Lutheran Academy. Uh, this is um, ties back to our waiting list. <laughs> we don't have enough room for the people who are interested to come to our school, and we really want to be able to accommodate anyone who would be interested in enrolling at our school. So we are really moving forward with this modular building right now, and we're in a really great place as far as the planning is concerned. I believe Matt Glowicki talked to the congregation about some of those plans a month ago. So he is the building committee chairperson, and he is the one who is um, in charge of all of the planning and things. He's the one to talk to if you're interested in helping. But we are currently looking for anyone who has construction experience, anything from plumbing to electrical to putting up walls. Um, Anything that we can do on our own will help defray the cost of the building. So that's part of the reason we're looking for that. And we are also still looking for help with writing grants. So if you have any experience with any of those things, you can talk to me or I will direct you to Matt Glowicki, who was here, he disappeared. But uh, I can give you his email and you can, I can get him in touch with you as well. So um, I believe those are all of the announcements that I have for CLA, and if you have any other questions or um, concerns or anything that you'd like to talk to me, I'll be hanging around after the service today. Once again, I thank you very much for allowing us to come here and for the children, allowing the children to come and use the spiritual gifts that they've been given to help uh, glorify God in worship with all of you. So thank you. Thank you. I think those are all the announcements. I invite all of you to join us in the cafeteria, and if you want to spill outside, it's still not too hot yet, I don't think. Uh, and enjoy the nice weather underneath the quad for a little food and fellowship. Have a blessed day.